Welcome, Dr. Epic here. What we're going to address in this final part of our lecture on American slavery is we're going to go ahead and tackle what the firmly established concept of American slavery does and did to American concepts. We're going to talk about poetry, we're going to talk about Quakers, abolitionists, DNA, and American mutts. And there's the outline for what's going to follow right up above me. So let's go ahead and begin. All of this is, of course, in service to the question being asked right up above me, which is, why build the institution of American slavery? Where did it come from? Why is it so unusual in world history? Was slavery profitable? Why did some want to destroy it immediately? And why did slavery persist after the revolution? When last we left off, 1705, the Virginia Slave Codes have been written. Large-scale importation of these poor enslaved Africans start to come over in very large numbers. We've got the laws set up, the system is in place, and as you can see from the chart above me, people are arriving. Large numbers of enslaved Africans begin to arrive, and because the laws make uh, slavery heritable, we now have large numbers of African Americans working the tobacco plantations, working the rice farms, working the indigo farms from Georgia all the way up to Maryland. Now, there is this idea in American history. You know, history is composed of, you know, trends, institutions, and events uh, with individuals thrown in there for good measure. And we have to talk about one of these philosophical trends that's going to kind of run contrary to this institution of American slavery. And that is this concept of American exceptionalism. So what is American exceptionalism? American exceptionalism is the idea that America is an exceptional place in the world. We are a place that is freer, more liberated, fairer, and more just than other places on earth. And a lot of this comes from this very famous speech by John Winthrop that's up above, which says, we shall find that the God of Israel is among us, that when 10 of us uh, will, shall be able to withstand a thousand of our enemies, when he shall make a praise and glory that men shall say of succeeding plantations, may the Lord make it like that of New England. For we must consider that we shall be as a city on a hill, the eyes of all the people are upon us. Now, John Winthrop is the guy who founded the Massachusetts Bay Colony. He founded Boston. And this is, there's this idea of American exceptionalism, that America is this exceptional place. We have to be a shining city on a hill, the new Jerusalem, a place that is more just, more fair, more free, more prosperous, and more powerful than any other place on earth, that we might not be God's chosen people, but we might be God's chosen instrument. And this is this very strong idea that America is better. America has to be this exceptional place, you know, and we should be. It's, it's not like God has chosen us, but we have to be worthy of this concept. This is American exceptionalism. But there's a problem here. Can you really be a shining city on a hill? The example to the rest of the world of freedom, justice, democracy, prosperity. If all of that is built off of the sale of your fellow man, are these two ideas compatible? Can you believe America is this exceptional place Yet at the same time, America is a place where a quarter of its own people are in a state of slavery. Are the two ideas compatible? And I hope you realize this. The answer is no. The two ideas are not compatible. And when you have two conflicting ideas in your head, this institutes a state of, of what psychologists call cognitive dissonance, where you have... At the same time, you hold two mutually opposed perspectives. Now, we, we know this all the time. Here's a very silly example. Um, I, you know, it's a football example. 
Um, I love watching my team win, Ugh, but I'm a Saints fan. See, those are two ideas that, that just do not get along together. Um, and that's a very silly example, but let's talk about really serious stuff for a second. Um, how can you be an exceptional place and yet a place that has a lot of slaves, imports slaves? They have to make these two ideas work. They have to make these two ideas work. You either have to get rid of the idea that America is an exceptional place, or you have to get rid of the I get rid of American slavery, or you've got to come up with an idea that allows these two opposing views to exist at the same time. And that's what the early Americans do. That's what they did in colonial America. They came up with a concept that allowed these two, two ideas to exist simultaneously. And that was racism. There's a lot of, I mean, a lot of people think racism created slavery. Uh, it's actually the other way around. The institution of American slavery created racism. And using racism, this idea that certain people are inherently inferior and that other people are inherently superior. That's racism. And that's what they invented. And long after slavery was gone, this insidious idea continued to poison American society for generations. So let's actually talk for a moment. What exactly is race, okay? What is race? Are races real things? And the answer is sort of, but not really. Uh, what is race? Race exists as a social construct. And race is socially constructed on the foundation of natural human biological variation. Uh, race is culturally based. It's flexible over time. Uh, the races we recognize today uh, did not exist a century or two ago. And the same races that we think about today will not exist in a century or two. And this is all based on natural human biological variation. Now, human biological variation clearly exists. I mean, it can be demonstrated to be to exist. People are different, all right? Um, and the whole of humanity can be loosely grouped, you know, very loosely grouped, into basically four subtypes based on geography. Uh, European, African, Asian, and Australasian. And uh, this is a very famous article by Sauer written in 1992 in which he basically said, uh, forensic anthropology and the concept of race. If races don't exist, why are forensic anthropologists so good at identifying them? Because basically, you know, forensic scientists can find these unclaimed bodies and study the craniofacial metrics of the skeleton, especially of the front of the skull, craniofacial metrics, and are, and are pretty accurate at determining uh, ancestry. Not necessarily race, but ancestry. Uh, forensic scientists can determine ancestry based on differences in bone structure, but they can't really tell race. Uh, and race itself changes over time. And this can be proven uh, by consulting the historical record. There are races that once existed in history in the past that simply aren't recognized as races anymore. For instance, the Irish. Uh, for much of American history, uh, the Irish in the United States were not considered white people. Uh, they were considered, the Irish were considered the Celtic race. They were cruelly discriminated against. They were, as you can see in this, in this cartoon uh, from the New York Times, portrayed as drunken, brutal, subhuman, like chimpanzees. You know, the Irish, there we go, the usual Irish way of doing things. He's sitting on a barrel of gunpowder, he has a lit torch and he's drunk. There you go. Uh, very cruelly discriminated against on racial bounds. Here's a popular song from the 19th century. No Irish need apply. And that racial category is gone. Okay. No one cares today. In fact, most people don't even know that. 
uh, the racial category, the Celtic race, the Irish race, uh, has largely ceased to exist. Uh, the first Irish-American president it was a big deal that he was Irish, and it was a big deal that he was Catholic. Uh, and there he is right up above me, uh, John F. Kennedy. Uh, that was a big deal. Uh, it was considered this big, groundbreaking thing. Uh, and that was the last sort of gasp of anti-Irish racism was the election of John F. Kennedy. Uh, but how, how about the second Irish-American president? No one knows. Like, I, I doubt if one in 20 students could even name the second Irish-American president simply because no one cares. Uh, the racial category ceases to exist, has ceased to exist. So what we recognize as races changes over time. Uh, these racial categories fall into and out of fashion. Old racial categories arise. The old racial categories fade. New racial categories arise. Uh, for instance, Hispanics did not exist before 1970. Uh, the term itself was invented by the United States government to describe the large number of immigrants arriving to the United States uh, af after the Second World War from Latin America. These immigrants from Mexico or Brazil or Argentina, Peru, uh, these uh, immigrants did not easily fit into the racial categories of 1950s uh, the United States. So the, so the government simply invented a new racial category uh, to describe them. They invented the term Hispanic, completely invented by the United States government. Uh, to a large extent, the, the term has gained traction. It's gained popularity and a new race was born. Uh, before this, people from Mexico, Mexicans, were generally considered to be either whites or Indians. Uh, there was no racial term. There was no racial category for Hispanics. So you got this really weird thing in American history that uh, where you have these incredibly racist Confederates from Texas, you know, who were of Mexican descent and were considered white. So if you travel back in time, if you traveled back in time to 1850, people from Mexico were considered white, but people from Ireland were not. Now, uh, the term has gained traction. There is clearly a Hispanic racial category. Um, and indeed, you can look at these polls, which are given, and there's some, you can always find these like videos on YouTube and stuff talking about, oh, this is, Latina, Latino, or this is Hispanic, or this is Chicano. That's all nonsense. The term is Hispanic. Uh, and it's Hispanic because that's the term that most people prefer to be called. Uh, overwhelmingly, uh, of the people who self-identify, they almost always self-identify generally as Hispanics uh, and a much, much smaller proportion as uh, Latina or Latino. Uh, almost no one identifies as anything else. So overwhelmingly, Hispanic is the term that most descendants from Latin American immigrants have chosen for themselves. It's a new race. But the whole point of this is to point out that race is clearly a social construct. It's culturally based. It's flexible over time. It is constructed on the foundation of human biological variation, uh, the races that were around 100 years ago are not around today. The races that exist today, that we recognize today, are not going to exist in 100 years or so. They're just not. Now, human biological variation uh, clearly exists. Um, and I want to pause for a moment and talk about uh, skin color because skin color is the most obvious and the most cosmetic feature, and it's what people are generally discriminated for or against. So I want to explain why, why do we actually have different colored skins. And basically it all has to do with ultraviolet radiation. Uh, up above me is a map of the ultraviolet radiation that different parts of the world receive. And different parts of the world receive different levels of ultraviolet radiation. And humans have this kind of love-hate relationship with the sun. We need it, but it hurts us. Uh, we need the sun for vitamin D production and for our livers to function and our immune systems to function normally, which is why everybody should get some sun. But too much sun can burn us, result in skin burns, melanomas, and skin cancers. 
So there's kind of like a Goldilocks zone for the amount of solar radiation we can receive. But again, the problem is, is that different parts of the Earth receive different levels of UV uh, radiation. So the natural human biological response has been to moderate skin color. This is why people who have lived, populations who have lived in an area that with high degrees of solar radiation, high degrees of UV radiation, have very, very dark skins because the problem is too much sun at that point. Whereas people who live in areas of the world that don't receive enough solar radiation have very, very light skins because the problem there is not enough UV radiation. So really, I mean, look at that picture on the lower left. It's, it's, it's sunblock. It's basically how much sunblock you're born with, which is both hilarious and sad at the same time. You know, all of this, you know, poor John Punch and John Castor and, you know, Jim Crow and civil rights and Marcus Garvey and Martin Luther King. It was all about people discriminating about like how much sunblock you're born with. It's, it's the racism is the stupidest thing ever. Stupid. And besides, we're American. And modern DNA testing has told us something that we should have known all along. I mean, we should have known this. That pretty much, and this is especially true the longer your family has been in the United States. And if your family's been in the United States for more than four or five generations, you're all a little, we're, we're all a little mixed. Uh, every, I mean, we, as Americans, we hold the biological, we hold the biological heritage of three continents, Europe, Africa, and Native America within us. We're all a little mixed. Right up above me is a news story about this white supremacist and who was on a talk show and uh, they did a genetic test on him. He's got a bunch of African ancestors. Um, on the left, there's a YouTuber and she wanted to figure out what part of Africa her ancestors came from. So she did a genetic test and found out that most of her ancestors come from Italy, uh, and a, a close, uh, a, a distant second was, uh, Ghana, West Africa and a close third Ireland. She's like three quarters European. Uh, modern DNA testing has told us that we're all a little mixed. There is no, not really such a thing uh, as a purely racial uh, category. Uh, and this is really apparent. I mean, this is, this is a coalition of data uh, from those, you know, like 23andMe and Ancestry.com websites where they're looking at people's genetic heritage and the science is in, it's incontrovertible. There is no sharp dividing line between any racial category uh, in the United States among the American people. We're all a little mixed. We're all a little European. We're all a little African. We're all a little Native American. And you can't really draw a line between any of these racial categories. Um, virtually everyone in the United States is descended from all three continents. And as you can see in the chart up above, the, the sort of light purple, that's European heritage. And it's, it's, you know, it's not evenly distributed, but it's widely distributed. The dark blue is African heritage. Again, not evenly distributed, but it's widely distributed. Um, and, uh, you know, this, this is posing uh, quite a problem for the people that argue for reparations from slavery, for instance. They argue, you know, if the logic is that the descendants of slaves deserve reparations for the enslavement of their ancestors, the science comes out and says something like 90% of the United States population is descended from slaves. You know, you look at these old pictures, uh, you know, from the 19th century or from the 18th century, these drawings of, you know, uh, of, of one person selling another person, both of those guys might be in, might be ancestors. Uh, you know, it's, it's not, it's, it's in, it's a widely distributed heritage. And if we consult the genetic information, you can see it there on the left of people who self-describe themselves as African Americans, you can see their genetic heritage, uh, and roughly, you know, about 70% of their genetic heritage is from, you know, the mother continent, Africa herself. 
But you can see, you know, 8 to 10% Native American, 20 to 24% European. Uh, of people who self-describe themselves as Hispanic, you know, Lat Latinos, uh, you know, their European heritage is 60 to 65%. Uh, their Native American heritage, 18 to 20. African heritage, 6 to 8%. Uh, you know, we, we, we have the heritage of three continents in us. We're all a little mixed. Of people who self-describe themselves as European Americans, have about 90 to 98% European heritage. But there's a little Africa, and there's a little Native American in there. And it's not only divided by self-professed ethnicity, by race, but it's also, uh, it's also, you have these regional clusters. And you can see in that little green map on the lower left that people who self-describe themselves as European Americans, Anglo-Americans, have a lot of African and have a lot of Indian in them. And you can see there, I mean, I mean, you can see Texas there on the left of people who describe themselves as uh, European Americans. If your family has been in Texas more than four or five generations, you should be about two to four percent Native American. You should be about one to three percent African. Uh, and of course, look, there you go. Got to talk about South Carolina. Look at South Carolina on that map of people who self-describe themselves as white, on average, have between five and 7% African heritage from South Carolina. Of course, South Carolina. Uh, the most racially mixed state is Louisiana. A uh, little bit of French and alcohol, everybody's all mixed together. I mean, look look at both of those maps. So we, ha we are all to some extent to a greater or a lesser extent racially mixed in the United States. And the longer your family has been in this country, the more racially mixed uh, you are likely to be. Here, and for example, let's, let's move away from statistics. Let's move away from genetic analysis. Let's talk about people, actual flesh and blood people. That is the descendants of Thomas Jefferson, the family of Thomas Jefferson. Uh, Thomas Jefferson, third president, of course, you can see him there on the lower left. Thomas Jefferson had children by two different women. There was his legal wife, um, uh, Martha Wales, and she died very early in their, in their marriage. And she had, a, I think he had a couple daughters by her. Uh, but more than a decade after her death, Thomas Jefferson began a 32 year relationship uh, with her half sister. Uh, a woman named, you can see her right there uh, to the left of me, a woman named uh, Sarah Hemings or Sally Hemings. Her nickname was Sally. And Sally Hemings was a, uh, a woman of mixed race. She was, she was an American slave and her grandmother was from Africa. And he had six children with her. And, you know, there are, there are people who argue that, ah, oh, you know, this is all hearsay and rumor. No, those, those people are wrong. Uh, there was clearly a, clearly a 32-year monogamous relationship between Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings. And they had children, and those children had children, and those children eventually had those kids. And that's what I'm talking about. This is America's past. You can look up above me. You can see that. It's one family that spans two different races. And there they are. And all of those people are related. But let's stop talking about the past. Let's talk about the future. I mean, what's going to happen with these racial categories? That, that, well, there we go. You know who that is, of course. That's Tiger Woods there in the center. What race are the children of Tiger Woods? I mean, Tiger Woods' father, that's Earl Woods right up above me. Uh, he's African-American. His mother is, I think, uh, from Thailand. And then Tiger Woods goes and marries uh, a Swedish supermodel and has two kids with her, and there they are on the left. There you go. What, what race? What are they? What race are they? Why am I showing a photo of an adorable mutt? Look, look at him. Mutts, mutts are the best dogs. They're loyal. They're faithful. 
They're friendly. They'll do what you got to do. Everybody loves mutts. They're the best dogs. Why am I showing a picture of an adorable mutt? You know why. So, returning to these two ideas, uh, I discussed that there is this point of contention, there's this cognitive dissonance between the idea of America as a nation that has to prove itself to be exceptional and a nation that also has the institution of American slavery. How can you get those two ideas to agree? Now, most of American society was like, okay, well, racism, that will solve our problems. But not everybody agreed to this. And even as they are constructing the institution of American slavery, the abolitionist movement is born. It's not a lot of people. It's only a few people. Dedicated, firm, evangelical Christians come out against the institution even before the first slave codes are written, you know, Virginia, 1705, Quakers and Puritans and Episcopalians come out against this concept of slavery. In 1688, in the colony of Pennsylvania, a group of Quakers come together to denounce what, what the House of Burgesses is doing down in Virginia, to denounce the concept of slavery. Even as American slavery is being established, people attack the idea. And they attack it specifically on religious grounds. Let's actually review the Germantown petition. Uh, there is a saying that we should do to all men as we will be done ourselves, making no difference of generation, descent, or color they are. To bring men hither to America, to rob or sell them against their will, we stand against. In Europe, there are many who are oppressed for conscience sake. And here are there are many oppressed which are of a black color. Pray, what thing in the world can be done worse towards us than if men should rob or steal us away and sell us for slaves in, sla in strange countries, separating husbands from their wives and children? That's the golden rule. Do unto others as you will have do unto yourself. And this it becomes the focal point of the early abolitionist movement. They want to destroy slavery because it is unchristian and therefore is un-American. And it's not just Quakers in Pennsylvania that come out against this. It's Puritans in New England. And the very first book attacking the concept of slavery is known as The Selling of Joseph, written by a Puritan judge named Samuel Sewell. And Samuel Sewell quotes the story of Joseph from the Bible. Joseph uh, of the coat of many colors, who's favored by his fathers, whose brothers beat him and sell him into slavery into Egypt. And Samuel Sewell writes the first abolitionist book, Attacking American Slavery, five years before the slave codes are even written. He attacks American slavery, saying, we are no better than Joseph's wicked brothers to beat our fellow man, to tear him down, and to sell him as if into Egypt. So the early abolitionists are attacking the unchristian nature of slavery. And to make this even, to make this sort of, to give this story another weird little quirk, Samuel Sewell is not famous for writing The Selling of Joseph. What makes Samuel Sewell famous is that he was one of the judges during the Salem witch trials. He ordered like, 19 people hung for witchcraft and he publicly repents of this is convinced he's going to hell because of it and spends the rest of his life trying to do good in new england and one of the things he decided to do as a printer uh in new england towards the end of his life was fight what they were doing down in virginia they were building american slavery and finally we come to Phyllis Wheatley. Phyllis Wheatley was African. She was born in Africa, in, in probably the kingdom of Mali, what is today modern Senegal. And Phyllis Wheatley was an orphan, and, and we, don't, we don't exactly know um, what happened to her parents. But she was seven or eight years old uh, in 1760, and she was an orphan. She was one of these unwanted people in Africa. So they sold her. 
Uh, they marched her to the coast and they sold her from one of those slave castles. And she journeyed across the Middle Passage uh, on a ship that was called the HMS Phyllis. And when she arrived in Boston, she was named after her ship, after the ship she took on the Middle Passage. And she was purchased by a Boston merchant named Wheatley. And he bought her in order that his daughter uh, could have a companion growing up. And uh, over time, the Wheatleys began to view Phyllis not as a slave that they owned, who was supposed to be the servant of their daughter, but over time they began to view her as their own daughter. And that's why they eventually freed her. And she was brought up in this household looking at the Wheatleys as her parents. And indeed, she took their name. And that is how this poor orphaned girl in Africa became Phyllis Wheatley. But it's not just that she was embraced and freed by her family in New England. It's what Phyllis does next, which is she's very well educated. She studies her adopted father's library very intensely. And she becomes the first great poet in American history, poetess. She writes these poems of like just surpassing beauty. She is one of the first literary geniuses in America. Uh, you know, this poor orphan slave girl. And Phyllis Wheatley, the first great literary genius in America, she basically demonstrates that this entire concept of racism, this entire thing they invented to justify their own, you know, profit and economic advantage, it's complete nonsense. These people from Africa are not inferior in any way, shape, or form. And Phyllis Wheatley's breathtakingly beautiful poetry demonstrates this. And this argument against slavery, the early abolitionists' argument, is a very, very strong argument. Um, and as we see over time, the northern states began to abolish slavery. Uh, we can see this even as the United States develops up above me, especially after the American Revolution, most of the northern states moved to abolish slavery. The unchristian nature of slavery is a very compelling argument, especially since slavery runs counter to the principles of the American Revolution itself. You know, all men are created equal. And on the lower left, you can see all of the states and the years of the abolition of slavery. Vermont in 1777, all the way to New Jersey in 1804. So slavery is abolished throughout the North. But remember the profitability of slavery. Slavery is only abolished in the parts of the United States where slavery is not profitable. In the South, where it is profitable, it stays. But not forever. And when we start talking about the revolution, we start talking about the political philosophy behind the American Revolution. One of the things you'll notice is that they don't really talk about slavery a whole lot. And one of the reasons they don't talk about slavery is that everyone was convinced after the American Revolution that slavery was going away, that the institution of American slavery was something we dreamed up uh, you know, during those bad old days of the English colonial, English colonies, and it, it, slavery is going away. And the reason everybody thought slavery was going away was because that the economies that profited off of slavery were all in a, in a state of advanced decline. By the 1790s, by 1800, all of these industries that relied on slavery were all in decline. The rice plantations of South Carolina that were predicated off raising rice and large amounts of rice and selling it to Barbados and selling it to the English colonies down in the Caribbean. After the revolution, the American states are, are, are cut off from the British Empire. We can't sell rice 
to the, to the sugarcane plantations of the Caribbean because they won't buy it from us. So the rice plantations collapse. Uh, the indigo, indigo is a dye, and that was being raised in large numbers and sold to the textile industry back in Britain. But again, after the revolution, that's cut off. The British were not part of the British Empire. The British aren't buying, you know, indigo. What about tobacco? We've still got tobacco, right? N no. Uh, by the 1790s, by 1800, they were learning a hard agricultural fact about tobacco, which is tobacco is a hungry, hungry crop. And you can build a tobacco plantation and it will produce tobacco for about 30 or 40 years. And then those tobacco plants have eaten all the nutrients that soil has. And what was your grandfather's profitable tobacco plantation is now, it's a little desert. Nothing's gonna grow there. So all of the, the tobacco plantations are on the verge of complete collapse. And people are cutting their slaves loose. They're letting their slaves go. You know, a lot of the founding fathers uh, manumit their slaves in their will. George Washington does. Uh, and they're doing this not so much out of the goodness of their own heart uh, or, or that they really buy into the abolitionist argument. It's just that there's no more profit to be made in slavery. By 1800, the institution of American slavery is on the verge of total collapse. Everybody's convinced it's something that's just going away. But then something happens. Something happens. That is what happens. We're in the 21st century, and we have this concept that new technology is always good. New, improved technology is always better. But history urges that we should have caution about this idea because they invent something in 1794 and it's invented and it's kind of a thing, but by 1807, it's in full production. And that thing is the machine on the lower left. Uh, and uh, you can see it animated how it works up above. 1794, Eli Whitney invents the cotton gin, which allows one to very quickly separate cotton from the seeds before, before which it had to be done by hand and it was very labor intensive and took forever. But once you have this machine, it's 50 times more efficient than hand picking and hand sorting cotton. It turns the cotton industry into something that is nearly perfect for enslaved labor. Eli Whitney's cotton gin, the cotton engine, was both a economic and technological marvel, but at the same time, for the United States, it was a social and moral disaster. And with the explosion of the cotton kingdom and the explosion of King Cotton, the Southern states dig in their heels on abolition. They stop that early process of abolition and absolutely 100% buy into these concepts of slavery and racism. And this permanently divides the nation into two groups, the Northern free states and the Southern slave states. And to some extent, places the country on the inevitable showdown between the two, between free and slave, between North and South, that will eventually result in the brutal conflict known as the American Civil War. Now, people often talk about slavery like it's something, oh, it's something that happened a long, long time ago. It's something that's very, that's past. And that's, that's not exactly true. That's not exactly true. And people say, well, how could, you know, somebody in, you know, Pennsylvania or somebody in upstate New York in 1800, you know, go about their day knowing that you know, millions of their fellow Americans were enslaved, you know, just a few hundred miles to their south. And the answer is they do it the same way that you and I do it. Uh, we just kind of don't talk about it and we pretend it doesn't exist. The same way we don't talk about it or we rarely talk about it and pretend that modern slavery doesn't exist. 
uh, modern slavery clearly exists. This is uh, we're in the 21st century, and it is a, a fact that there are roughly somewhere between 20 and 30 million slaves that are currently owned in the world. Whether they are you know, in forced labor camps in China, or they're bought and sold in Africa, or they're you know, the wrong caste in India, there are modern slaves. Most of them are concentrated in Central Africa or in East and Southern Asia, but the modern scourge of the scourge of slavery is is still among us and there are very sad stories which are taking place right now western china there's almost a million uyghur slaves that are enslaved by the chinese government um, in india you have people that are born from the lowest castes including children that are forced into uh, appalling work conditions that are they're, they're slaves uh, in Africa, in you know specifically in Libya, you have had the reemergence of people being bought and sold at auction. Horrific. So modern slavery exists. It is a scourge that is still among us today, and it's a scourge that we don't we don't really know what to do with. I mean, are are can we really go into another country and tell them what to do? I don't know. I don't have the answers. Uh, and I, I would love to meet someone who did. But anyway, it's heavy. These are heavy, heavy historical things to talk about. They're heavy modern things to talk about. So just, just let, let the little kitten take them away. Let the little kitten take away all the heavy, just, just take, just take away all of the heavy, just, Oh, look at him. The eyes go in two different directions. His little face. Oh, his little face. He's, he's in a basket. He doesn't, he doesn't know what a basket is. At any rate, you now have all the pieces to the puzzle. Why build the institution of American slavery? Where did it come from? Why is it so unusual in world history? Was slavery profitable? Why did some want to destroy it? And why did slavery persist even after the American Revolution? You have all the pieces to put that puzzle together. And I'm going to ask you to do so very soon. And this concludes our discussion of American slavery. Next, we're going to move on and talk about other topics. Everyone's favorite, 18th century political theory. And I will see you there.